in terms of the critical appraisals of a research paper that you want to um, judge for yourself whether this paper is worth reading or whether the interpretation is believe believable or not there are some key considerations and um, i have listed some of these considerations here and does not necessarily mean that you have to follow exactly the same order but these are some of the key considerations that you need to take into account the first thing you need to consider is that uh, what is the clinical uh, utility. So for example, if you are going to use a machine learning method, you need to have a very clear understanding of what is the explanation or rationale of you using that machine learning method. So that explanation needs to be clear. Along with that explanation, you need to check the aim, whether that aim is clear or whether uh, it makes sense for that aim to use the particular machine learning method that you are using. Um, and there, there could be different types of aim. One aim could be, it could be a prediction of the outcome, or it could be, what are the covariates that are most important in predicting the outcome, right? So there is a distinction. Like at first you were tr just trying to get the best outcome that you can get. And in another, like outcome is the outcome, but you want to figure out what are the best, uh, best covariates to uh, predict your outcome. So those are kind of like a two different types of outcome we are talking about. The second issue is the data source and the study description. Uh, this part is very important as I have mentioned earlier that some of these data sources are maybe not equipped to deal with the particular research question that you are dealing with. Maybe the data was collected for a very different purpose. So for example, for the uh, electronic health record data, those are basically collected for billing purposes uh, and administrative purposes. Maybe some of the variables that you need for your research are not in that data set. So it is absolutely important for you as a reader to understand uh, why the data was collected, under which design the data was collected. Was it a randomized clinical trial data? Was it a cross-sectional data? Was it an observational data? Uh, longitudinal data, or maybe there are some uh, nationally representative surveys that are collected by the Statistics Canada. Are these the data set that are, were collected for, for, from those surveys? Along with the data uh, design, you also need to know uh, when did the study start? When did the uh, study end? Um, what was the baseline or the index date? That is absolutely important. Uh, for you to properly design any kind of study, like what do you consider as a baseline? Usually baseline is a time where everybody is uh, sort of comparable with each other and that you want to be your baseline for your study. Um, and you need to look into the paper to figure out whether they have reported any kind of baseline in the study and whether they are clear about their baseline. Um, other consideration are that sometime uh, so, for example, when a patient goes to the clinic, then their data is recorded. So, for example, for the multiple sclerosis patients, um, what happens in multiple sclerosis? Are any of you familiar with multiple sclerosis, by the way? So, one thing that happens is that uh, this is a disease that attacks your uh, nerve cells, and over time, you, you lose your ability to move um, and, and do many different uh, tasks. So you get disable and disable uh, over time. So one of the things the doctor do is that they just give you some test to figure out like at which stage of your disability you are in right now. Like do, can you walk without any assistance or do you need a cane and stuff like that. And based on that, they, they measure like how, what is the disability score that you have. But the problem is these, like this can only happen when a patient is at a clinic. If a patient is not at a clinic, they cannot really measure that. And as a consequence, what happens is that, say for example, one patient went to clinic after four years. So there would be no data between the previous, uh, at baseline maybe, and, and after four years. So in between, there would not be any data. Versus you can think of another patient who is maybe more compliant and uh, more conscious about their health, and they went to the clinic, say for example, every year. So what would what th then happen would that in the same data set, uh, the second patient would have data set in every year, 
whereas the first question would have like uh, really uh, data that are measured at a, a long distance. Um, so as, as a result, what will happen as an analyst, when you try to analyze the data, for one patient, there are more frequent data, for another patient, there are less frequent data, and this is kind of like a missing data problem that you are having. Uh, so you need to, as an analyst, then you need to make a determination of what can you do with this missing uh, observation thing. Do you want to improve them? Do you want to get rid of them? Like what, what is the decision that you want to make? So in the paper, it also needs to be very clear about what is the target population. Why this target population is important? Because you obviously want to make a prediction. You want to make a generalization of your results, right? And if you are not clear about your target population, so whenever you are doing this complete case analysis and chopping off half of the population, your target population is not really clear anymore, right? So at the very beginning of the paper, it should be absolutely clear what is your target population. It could be all Canadian adult above 18 years or old who may eventually suffer from cardiovascular event. It could be as simple as that, but it needs to define that somewhere in the paper. All right. Then we talk about analytic data. You do have to understand that analytic data uh, is something that the analyst will use to build their model. So that has to mirror some way the true target population that it is trying to target, right? And that, that is why you need to be very clear about the inclusion and exclusion criteria. If you are dealing with pregnant women and then you are having all of all sorts of mail in your data set and you are just imputing whether they were pregnant or not, that is simply not going to work, right? So, so I mean, people do that, by the way, but, but I mean, that, that's kind of an extreme example that I'm giving, but people do this kind of stuff. and. Uh, you have to be very careful about this kind of um, decision that they make. And usually by reading a paper, sometimes you, you will figure out that they are dealing with that their target population is pregnant women, but they, they have like 60% uh, of the participants are male. Like how does that make sense, right? So you have to be very careful about that. Um, uh, and in the analytic data, obviously you do all sorts of uh, pre-processing. You need to understand what are the pre-processing they are going through and also need to understand why did they go through those pre-processing. There has to be a reason why they went through them and that needs to be clarified in the paper. And as you can understand, you need to get a better understanding of how this inclusion and exclusion criteria came into being, where clinicians were consulted to determine this inclusion exclusion criteria, or maybe, oh, this 60% of the data had missing, so we just got rid of them. That's not a clinical criteria, by the way. So you have to get a general sense of uh, how this inclusion and exclusion criteria were developed. And sometimes what people do is that they try to publish a protocol. But one thing I can say is that protocol is generally uh, common for clinical trials. But if you are doing an observational study based on the electronic health record data that you have happen to have access to, generally people do not have protocols. So um, yeah, generally for the observational data, this is not very common. Okay. Uh, you need to have a very good understanding of the data dimensions uh, and the split ratios. That means that total sample size, analytic sample size. So what is the difference between total and analytic? Based on exclusion criteria, some of the patients will be excluded, right? And the analytic data would not include those excluded patients. And then you have the training, tuning, testing, data size, and stuff like that, all, all sorts of things uh, that the paper should be very clear about what were the ratios or the uh, data sizes when they were doing this kind of stuff. For the outcome model, like what kind of uh, outcome data we are dealing with? Are we dealing with soft outcomes? Are we dealing with... Um, uh, hard outcomes um, and what was the gold standard based on which this uh, outcome was de uh, developed. So for example, if your outcome is some sort of mortality, you obviously know this is a hard outcome and uh, there is not much you can do to improve. Uh, but if you are dealing with a soft outcome, maybe try to think about whether if you are doing the analysis, maybe try to think about whether there was another measurement that you could have used that would have given you better prediction model development process. Okay, other than the outcome, you could still have the features. What, what are these features? These are basically the covariates and these covariates are 
uh, you need to have a general understanding of how these co-bidders were selected. Were they selected based on some sort of p value approach or maybe the analyst was diligent enough to go to the clinicians to consult which co should be included in the model. Uh, and they talked with the subject area expert. Whether there was any transformation that was done, whether there was any uh, baseline characteristic table that was presented in the table. So that would probably give you a better understanding of the characteristic of the variables that were used. If there was any missing data, how much of the data was missing, what was done with the missing data, and uh, what was the end result. Machine learning model choice, that basically means that rationale of the model choice, like why you chose the model that you chose. Was there a reason? Was there like multicollinearity going on? Was there some, was it hard to find the interactions and stuff like that? And uh, if you are using a parametric model, basically, then you have to be very careful about uh, saying what was the model specification. So age plus sex plus income plus uh, the, uh, the other variable and stuff like that. So all of these things that needs to be very clear in the model. Uh, and whether there was any uh, polynomial term, whether there was any uh, nonlinear terms, like, uh, so basically polynomial would be a nonlinear term and ad non-additive would be the interaction terms and whether those terms were used in the model. And depending on how many covariates they have used, that would dictate how many parameters you have. So for example, if you have five covariates, then you, including the interaction term, you would have six parameter. And if you have one more interaction term, then you would have seven parameters and things like that. Machine learning model details. So if the model was tuned, you need to know what were the tuning parameters, the hyperparameters that were used, what exact tuning hyperparameters were used and decided how did they come up with the hyperparameters and whether the hyperparameters were provided in the paper. The next point is how did they address optimism problem? Did they do any kind of cross validation, split sample uh, validation, any kind of valid internal validation process? Did they do any kind of inter internal validation process? You, they need to uh, talk about that. And in terms of generalizability, like did they do any kind of external validation? That means what, like not even using the same data or same type of data, they were trying the data in a different, maybe geographical location or a different uh, time location when the data was collected. In terms of reproducibility, reproducibility could be in terms of three different ways. It could, they could, Sometimes it is hard to reproduce even the model when, when say for example, you are using the deep learning model and the weights are different. Sometimes even the reproducibility can be different. Uh, the code could be reproducible if you just give away the code in a GitHub or any other pages. And uh, sometimes the data are openly accessible. Then uh, you have these three levels of reproducibility. If you can reproduce the model code and data, the whole analysis is reproducible. If you just give them the model and code, but no data, then the model is not, uh, the result is not basically reproducible, right? But at least you can give the code to uh, let the readers know what exactly, uh, what exact decisions were ta taken to come up to the final modeling stage. And interpretability means that it's not just some data scientists that came up with this model. Some clinicians were consulted uh, for this. And uh, at the last stage, sometimes it happens that on top of the original model, they are interested in particular subgroups as well. Say for example, if you are dealing with cardiovascular events, then maybe you want to also check what was happening within the uh, diabetic patients who had cardiovascular event, right? So for example, for the uh, groups that are at high risk, you want to uh, take into consideration of what, what was happening in that particular situation. Uh, 